Hey, welcome to part two in our message series, God's Dream for Your Life. Did you know God has a dream for your life? In fact, that's what we learned last week when we started to study the life of Joseph in the book of Genesis, the oldest book of the Bible. We learned that God had a dream and God has a dream for you. God's dream for your life is probably way bigger than your dream, but it might also be harder than your dream. And in the end, it will be worth it if you choose God's dream for your life. Well, here's a question I want you to just identify in your life right now. What's one dream or desire that's on your heart? Maybe it's a desire for your relationships, for your marriage. Maybe it has to do with your finances or your career. Maybe it's a dream or desire for your health. Maybe it's a dream for our nation, for our children and grandchildren and what society in the United States would be like. I wonder that dream in your life, if you think of it as a train on train tracks, is it kind of cruising along? Is it slowly chugging along or maybe has it come to a complete standstill? I know sometimes in lives our our dreams are moving along fine. Other times they're stopped and other times they look kind of like this, completely derailed. I know this has been the case in my life and I won't bore you with all the examples, but there have been many times where I've had a dream and I've even felt like it's from God and there have been moments where it feels like this, where it looks not just stopped, but completely destroyed. You know, live long enough and you will face some obstacles. You'll face difficulties. You'll even see some of your dreams completely derailed. That was the case for Joseph. But today, we're going to learn the answer to this question in your life. When your dream is derailed, how can you get it back on track? When your dream is destroyed to such a degree that you think there's just no way this thing could ever happen, how can you get it back on track? If I could tell you in the next 20 minutes or so how to get your dream back on track, would you want to know how? Well, that's what we're going to learn today from Joseph. Now you might remember from last week, Joseph was about 17 years old when God gave him a dream. In fact, this ancient dream in the book of Genesis is where we get our phraseology and our idea of having a dream in life. It comes from Joseph. God gives him a dream, actually two dreams that fit together. And very soon after, his brothers say, we're going to stop the dream. We're not going to let God's dream happen in Joseph's life. In fact, Joseph found them out working and they ripped the robe off of Joseph, the expensive ornate robe that his dad had gotten him. They throw him into a cistern, a dried up well out in the desert. Then they hear these slave traders coming by and they decide to sell their brother as a slave. Well, Joseph then gets carted along to Egypt a foreign land where he's separated from his parents, separated from his brothers. And in Genesis 39, we're gonna pick up the story in verse one. It says, now Joseph had been taken there to Egypt and Potiphar, an Egyptian who's one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelite slave traders who had taken him. Now, it seems at this moment, if we were looking at Joseph through a human lens, like God must not be with Joseph. God must not care. After all, he's been sold as a slave. Now he's been bought by a slave master who's probably a very cruel guy if he's the captain of the guard. But look at verse two. God's word tells us this. The Lord was with Joseph. I don't know where in your life right now you might feel like God's not with you. You might feel like because your dream is so destroyed and so derailed that God doesn't care, that God's not paying attention. Surely Joseph could have felt that way and yet God tells us that God was still with Joseph even as a slave. And so because God's with Joseph, God prospers him. And I want you to know where you're in an uncomfortable situation. If you will believe that God is with you, He can prosper you even if you're in a situation that you don't want to be in because we're going to see Joseph doesn't stay here forever. Although the journey from being a slave to eventually being a world ruler is going to be full of a lot more ups 
and some very deep downs. Verse four, Joseph found favor in the eyes of Potiphar. And so Potiphar puts him in charge of the entire house. Potiphar probably had a large estate with you know, lots of properties and Joseph becomes Potiphar's right-hand man. He's in charge of it all. Little does Joseph know as right-hand person to Potiphar, God's training Joseph because someday he's gonna be the right-hand person to Pharaoh. But the journey there is not an easy one. From this time, Potiphar, verse five tells us, puts Joseph in charge of everything because God just keeps blessing everything that Joseph does. You know, it's so interesting. Joseph could have obsessed on God, why am I a slave? Why have I been separated from my family? Why am I in a foreign land? And instead, Joseph was focused on the presence of God with him. I wonder where in your life right now you've been obsessed about what's been going wrong But instead today, the spirit of God is saying to you, I am with you. And if you will obsess on the fact that I'm with you, I can bless you even right where you are today. Well, Joseph around this time, we don't know how many years go on. He was 17 when he was sold by his brothers. We know he's 30 when he takes over with Pharaoh. So there's 13 years that he's a slave and imprisoned. Somewhere, probably in Joseph's early 20s or maybe mid-20s, we're told this in the second half of verse 6. It says, now Joseph was well-built and handsome. So he was an attractive dude. In fact, the Hebrew here has this idea, the language, that he was physically attractive, but he was also emotionally and socially an attractive person. Well, Potiphar's wife, who's home all day while Joseph is taking care of the property, she notices this fit, attractive young man. And after a while, she comes on to him and she says, come to bed with me. Now, this is so interesting what Joseph responds. It says he refused. He refused and he says, with me in charge, my master doesn't concern himself with anything. And we're told in the text that the wife continues to come on to him. But Joseph says this in verse nine, my master has withheld nothing from me except for you because you're his wife. So how then could I do such a wicked thing? And notice this, here's Joseph. What is his perspective of reality? He says, I'm not gonna sin against Potiphar, but most importantly, I'm not gonna sin against God. You see how God was the biggest person in Joseph's view. And then look at this verse 10. Although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her. Now think about this. Joseph is young, he's attractive. His body is at its prime. She's coming on to him day after day after day. What a temptation. What a temptation that he probably could have gotten away with. And if he had done this, and if he had gotten away with it, he would have missed God's dream for his life. You see, God's dream for your life, God's the one who does it, but you do have your part to play. And when it comes to things like temptation, God knows that we're not perfect, but did you know that you can get yourself off the path of God's dream for your life, or you can work to keep yourself on the path? Well, Joseph kept himself on the path, even though his obedience to God is gonna require some suffering for a moment. Although she spoke with him over and over, he refused. And then one day, Potiphar's wife, she comes on to Joseph when they're alone in the house. And she actually grabs Joseph's cloak. This is a theme in his life. His clothing keeps getting him in trouble. She grabs his cloak and it says that he fled. He just ran. He was like, I don't even wanna get close to sinning. So he runs out of the house. She has his garment, his outer garment in her hands. Then she calls for all the other servants and she makes up this story. She more or less says, Joseph tried to rape me and look, here's his cloak. And then verse 17, we're told this. She told Potiphar this story, that Hebrew slave that you brought us, he came in here to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed, Potiphar, as soon as I screamed, he ran for it. And look, that's why I have his cloak I grabbed it as he ran out of the house. 
So Joseph is now falsely accused. And then listen to this. When his master heard the story saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Have you ever been falsely accused? Have you ever been lied about? Joseph was, and it's not like he was just lied about on the internet or bullied a little bit at school. His master burned with rage against him. And then his master, a powerful political ruler, throws him into prison. Look at verse 20. It says, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison. Now, if you're watching this story from a merely human perspective, you're thinking, well, God's dream for Joseph is never going to come true. But if you're watching this story from God's perspective, you realize that this prison is on the path to the palace. This prison isn't a normal prison. You see, because Potiphar was the captain of the guard for Pharaoh, this was Pharaoh's prison. And while Joseph doesn't even know it, God has a plan for Joseph being in this particular prison. And look at this. While Joseph was there in prison, here's our theme today. The Lord was with him. You remember when he was a slave, the Lord was with him. Now he's a prisoner, the Lord is with him. Where you feel like a slave, where you feel like a prisoner, where you feel like your dream has imploded or has completely derailed. If you're placing your faith in Jesus today, the Lord is with you. And as we learned last week, there's no power on earth or even in hell that can stop God's dream from happening in your life. The only person who could stop it is you if you choose to get off the path. Joseph continues to believe God. He continues to obey God even when it's hard, even when obeying God sends him to prison. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Now this becomes a theme in Joseph's life, that when things go terrible, God continues to be with him. And just like he got promoted from entry-level slave all the way up to slave who's in charge of the whole house. Now he's going to be entry-level inmate, and pretty soon the prison warden's going to say, hey, I'm going to give you some responsibilities around here because you're so honest, you're so reliable, you're so faithful. How is it that Joseph continues to be blessed even in the most impossible circumstances? Well, it's this theme. Let's put these two verses side by side. The Lord was with Joseph when he was a slave. The Lord was with Joseph when he was an inmate. You see, Joseph's blessing, yes, he worked hard, but it ultimately came from the presence of God. And this is what you need to know in your life today where you feel like your dreams have come off the tracks. This is what we learn from Joseph. Every obstacle becomes an opportunity, not by positive thinking, not by hard work. Those are fine, but those can't get you out of prison. Those can't get you out of slavery. Only God can do those things. Your obstacles become opportunities when God's involved. So here's my question. Is God involved in your life? Is God involved in your daily choices? Where you feel like you're trapped in an obstacle that you could never overcome. Are you saying like Joseph, God, I need your presence with me. God, your presence is the only hope that I have. What did evil do in Joseph's life? Evil abused Joseph. Evil sold Joseph as a slave. Evil tore Joseph away from the people he loved. Evil falsely accused Joseph. Evil imprisoned Joseph. But meanwhile, God was bigger than any of those circumstances. What did God do in response to evil? He remained present with Joseph, even in adversity. He prospered Joseph, even in adversity. He gave success to Joseph in all that he did, even when he was doing it as a slave or as a prisoner. He allowed others to see that his hand of blessing was on Joseph's life. Did you notice that in the text? And then he gave continual success to Joseph's work. Let me give you today three steps for you to turn your obstacles into opportunities by insisting on the God who has the power 
to transform your obstacles into opportunities. Three steps, here they are. Obsess on God being with you. Now, if you're anything like me, when your dream comes off the tracks, when life is difficult, you obsess on the problem. I know I do it too. I'm not judging you when you do that, okay? We obsess on the person who's against us or the thing that we can't control. What Joseph did was obsess on God with him. Did you notice that when he was tempted and he said, how could I sin against God? He was more obsessed with God than with his circumstances. Secondly, he obeyed right where God had placed him. Instead of complaining and moaning and griping and saying, why am I a slave or why am I a prisoner? He said, God is with me here. I'm going to obey God where I've been planted. And I'm going to act with integrity and honesty and character. And I'm going to do my best while I leave to God the rest. He obsessed on God. He obeyed. And then he orientated his hopes. Now, that's a weird verb, isn't it? Orientate. You know what it is? It's something you do every day. When you're on your phone like this, and then you want to see the picture better, so you turn it sideways, you're reorienting your phone. This verb, orientate, you know what it means literally? To adjust to a situation. My elementary age kids do this. If they ask to play a game on my phone, I see them orientated. Joseph orientated. He adjusted his view to see God as bigger than his circumstances. You know, your success or failure in life, it doesn't depend on your circumstances, it depends on your God. And if God is with you, then you can be a slave or a prisoner and become a world ruler like Joseph. If God's not with you, you can be a world ruler and everything can fall apart. Most importantly, when you place your faith in Christ, his spirit is with you in this life but you're promised that you will be in the presence of God for eternal life. Do you know Christ as your savior? And if you do, have you surrendered to God's dream for your life? How do you reorient, if you will, orientate your view to see God more? Well, 2 Corinthians 4 puts it this way for all of us who are followers of Christ. It says, so we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, Everyone around us, unbelievers, they obsess about what they can see. And God cares about those things. But we fix our eyes instead on the eternal. This is part of your spiritual growth. You see, God cares about the things that you can see and feel. And he wants to work in those areas of your life. But it's as you really read the word of God and obey God that you start to get God's heart for serving others, for loving others. You start to see the people around you not as uh, opponents or as consumers or even as neighbors, but as eternal souls. And you start to see that God's dream for your life, it's a lot more than kicking back at the beach someday. It's about his redemption and rescue of all humanity. You see Joseph's life, and we'll learn more about it next week, God ends up using Joseph. The culmination of his dream isn't that he's in charge of Egypt. It's that he saves many souls in that position of power. You know, God uses people who insist on his presence. Just like Joseph insisted on, I need to have God with me, we benefit from others, whether it's our parents or spiritual leaders, others who insist on the presence of God. We're going through a time of national crisis And it's not the first time in the history of our relatively young nation in the scope of human history. Back in the Civil War, more than 600,000 Americans had been killed by other Americans in hand-to-hand and brutal combat during the Civil War. And it was in that time that God had positioned a leader, a man of faith, who said, I insist on the presence of God. Listen to this proclamation from Abraham Lincoln given in the midst of the Civil War. Lincoln said, It's the duty of nations as well as of men to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures, the Christian Bible, and proven by all history that those nations are blessed whose God is the Lord. 
You know what Lincoln had right from his Sunday school growing up as a kid in church? Riches don't come from gold. Riches come from God. And Lincoln knew enough to say, young nation of America with all your prosperity, your prosperity isn't from the material world. Your prosperity is from God. But then Lincoln says this, we have forgotten God. Why are we in a civil war? Why are we killing each other? It's because we've forgotten God. We've forgotten that his hand is what has preserved us in peace. And then Lincoln says this, it behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins and to pray for forgiveness. This was the proclamation. It wasn't just Lincoln. It was the entire Senate and Congress were in agreement with him to say every American, about 98% of Americans were Christian at the time. Every American should take a day where all we do is pray that God would heal our land. And what should we pray for? Lincoln said this, let's ask God for the pardon of our national sins. That would include the sin of slavery and the restoration of our now divided and suffering country. Boy, those words seem so true today, don't they? And it's incredible that God used a person of faith to lead a nation that was divided and was literally about to derail and about to completely destroy the dream that was America. Who does God use to get it back on track? A person who says, Blessing comes from Almighty God. You see, people who insist on God's presence see obstacles become opportunities. God used Abraham Lincoln as one leader to make obstacles an opportunity in American history. Now, was Lincoln perfect? Were the Christians of that era perfect? Is anyone other than Jesus perfect? The answer to all of it is no. But God used Lincoln despite his imperfections because he insisted on God's presence. God gave a dream for national unity to this young congressman from Illinois who was recently president, who, by the way, if you study his life, had all sorts of the same ups and downs as Joseph. And God gave a dream to another leader about 100 years later a little boy who had grown up in Baptist Sunday schools, who gave his life to become a pastor and a reverend, God gave him a dream to continue healing a land that remained broken from the consequences of slavery. A dream that we in our day still now carry this lineage that there's still healing to be done. I love this picture from April 3rd, 1968. You see, in this moment, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is preaching a sermon. He's preaching a sermon about the Good Samaritan, someone of a different race who stopped to help an abused person of another race. You see, this sermon would be Martin Luther King's final sermon. It was a day after this sermon that an assassin took the life of MLK. And while I long to play for you the entire 43-minute sermon, his final one, I want to play for you a segment of it. And I want to ask you to give your very best attention to this because I believe God's going to speak to you powerfully, not only about the need that only God can heal our land today, but also about the power of our lives when we surrender to God's dream for our life. You see, MLK's life had a power to it because God was in it. And here's what I want you to listen for in Martin Luther King's final words. I want you to listen how he finds his strength, not in the crowds or the accolades, but in the presence of God. I want you to listen to the fulfillment that comes from living God's dream for your life. I want you to hear the fearlessness that results from walking with God. And I want you to hear how Martin Luther King's definitions of right and wrong, they don't come from the culture, they come from the word of God. Let's listen now to the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination And let us move on. In these powerful days,
these days of challenge to make America what it ought to be. We have an opportunity to make America a better nation. And I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. And while sitting there autographing books, a demented black woman came up. The only question I heard from her was, are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down writing, and I said, yes. The next minute, I felt something beating on my chest. Before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this demented woman. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon. That blade had gone through, and the x-rays revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta, the main artery. And once that's punctured, you're drowned in your own blood. That's the end of you. It came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had merely sneezed, I would have died. Well, about four days later, they allowed me, after the operation, after my chest had been opened and the blade had been taken out, to move around in the wheelchair in the hospital. They allowed me to read some of the mail that came in, and from all over the states and the world, kind letters came in. I read a few, but one of them I will never forget. I had received one from the president and the vice president. I've forgotten what those telegrams said. I'd received a visit and a letter from the governor of New York, but I've forgotten what that letter said. But there was another letter that came from a little girl, a young girl, who was a student at the White Plains High School. And I looked at that letter, and I'll never forget it. It said simply, Dear Dr. King, I am a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. She said, while it should not matter, I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering. And I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. And I'm simply writing you to say that I'm so happy that you didn't sneeze. And I want to say tonight, I want to say tonight that I, too, am happy that I didn't sneeze, because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960, when students all over the South started sitting in at lunch counters. And I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best in the American dream, and taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy, which were dug deep by the Founding Fathers in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, if I had sneezed. I wouldn't have been around here in 1961 when we decided to take a ride for freedom and ended segregation in interstate travel. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1962, when Negroes in all Bennett, Georgia, decided to straighten their backs up. And whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. If I had sneezed, if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been here in 1963. Black people of Birmingham, Alabama, aroused the conscience of this nation and brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had a chance later that year in August to try to tell America about a dream that I had had.
if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been down in Selma, Alabama, to see the great movement there if I had sneezed. I wouldn't have been in Memphis to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I'm so happy that I didn't sneeze. And they were telling me. Now it doesn't matter now. It really doesn't matter what happens now. I left Atlanta this morning and as we got started on the plane, there were six of us. The pilot said over the public address system, we are sorry for the delay. But we have Dr. Martin Luther King on the plane. And to be sure that all of the bags were checked. And to be sure that nothing would be wrong on the plane. We had to check out everything carefully, and we've had the plane protected and guarded all night. And then I got into Memphis, and some began to say the threats, or talk about the threats that were out, or what would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. God had a dream for this little boy, Martin Luther King Jr., who would grow up to impact our society, to change the lives of millions of people for the better. You can drive to any downtown in the United States today and see a Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. God had a dream for his life. And I love this idea that God ordained every sneeze in Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. You know, we still have so much work to do in the fight of good against evil of God's love for all mankind against racism. The fight continues in our day, and God uses people who will say what MLK said. Did you catch this? Remember, these are the final words. The very next day, he's going to be assassinated, but he has this almost prophetic sense. I love what he said. Like anybody, I would like to live, but I'm not concerned about that now. You see, he had traded in the American dream life for God's dream for his life. A dream that would save others, a dream that would help others. And he said, I just want to do God's will. Have you ever said that in your life? God, I want to do your will in my life. I mean, what if God's dream for your life is involved in the saving and the rescue of many other people? What if God's dream for your life is far bigger than the little comforts that you had been calling a dream for your life. Have you ever in your life said, God, I just want your will in my life? Have you said that recently? Will you say that today? God, however you want to use me in your great plan of redemption, your great plan to overcome evil, 
I love that the very final words that Martin Luther King Jr. preached were when he said, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. You see, those are lyrics from a song that all those Christians in that church would have known. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And it's all about Jesus' return. When he will judge evil, when he will rescue his followers, when he will make everything right. I love this reality that today, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr. and Joseph are each alive and they're each in the same place. And that we can commit our lives to the same great cause of God in this world. That song, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory of the Coming of the Lord, it's based on this scripture in 2 Timothy 4. It says this, Now there is in store for me, The crown of righteousness. You see, Paul the Apostle, like Martin Luther King Jr., gave his life to help others. And he said, just as an athlete runs in a race, there's a crown for those of us who say, God, we want to do your will in this world. We will seek first your kingdom in this world. There's a crown of righteousness laid up, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me. God gives awards to your life when you meet him based on how you say, God, I'm going to do your work in the world. And not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. Martin Luther King Jr. was fearless in the face of death because he knew that he had a God who could turn any obstacle into an opportunity as long as God was with him. And it's because God was with him that he was able to change a nation. And it's because God's with you and with me, with us as a church, that we can be part of national change, of eternal change, of saving souls. So let's commit today to say, God, we want your dream in our lives. Let me pray that for you right now. Father, Lord, we thank you for these inspiring, inspiring examples. And Father, I can't wait to meet Martin Luther King Jr. there in your presence. I can't wait to meet Abraham Lincoln and Joseph. But God, right now, you've placed each of us at this moment in history, not by accident, but on purpose. And just like Joseph, you want to use us in the saving of many people. And Lord, you want to take what Satan means for evil and you want to turn it for good as we turn to you. And so God, just like Joseph, just like Lincoln, just like Martin Luther King Jr., we insist on your presence in our lives. God, only you can turn hearts. Only you can change nations. Only you can heal this land. Only you can heal what's broken inside of us. And so today we commit ourselves to live not our dreams for our lives, but to live your dream for each of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.